Hello and welcome. I'm Elaine Didier, Director of the Gerald Ford Presidential Library and Museum, located in Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids, Michigan. My colleagues and I are pleased to introduce you to our new virtual museum series. The Library and Museum are proud to be one of the Presidential Libraries within the National Archives and Records Administration. We are honored to be stewards of the many congressional, presidential, and personal papers and artifacts of both President Ford, Mrs. Ford, and many members of the Ford administration. Thanks to the support of the National Archives and the Ford Presidential Foundation, we are able to bring our collections to life for you. Please take your time and enjoy your virtual tour experience at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum. Gerald Ford made his way from Grand Rapids in the fall of 1931 to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he enrolled in the University of Michigan. Uh, he was one of the star athletic recruits of that year. And on his first day on campus, as he was enrolling in classes, he met the other star recruit, a young man from Detroit by the name of Willis Ward, who had become the first African-American in decades to play football at the University of Michigan. Their story would intersect his senior year in 1934. But along the way, Gerald Ford got involved in campus life in other ways. He pledged to Delta Kappa Epsilon, which at the time was one of the rowdiest um, fraternities on the University of Michigan's campus living just on the edge of being decertified and kicked off. Gerald Ford would never be the rowdy one at the party, uh, but he enjoyed his time at Delta Kappa Epsilon and the friendships that he would carry with him from the University of Michigan into the later parts of his life were found there in that fraternity house. But his name is made at the University of Michigan playing football. Gerald Ford's luck ran out in his sophomore year. He was playing behind a fellow by the name of Chuck Bernard, who was an All-American center. And Chuck Bernard remained healthy through the remainder of his career, but Ford would make the traveling team and play backup to Bernard and uh, would play in many of the games. Then in 1934, Bernard had graduated and Ford was going to be the starting center and he and Willis Ward were going to take the field together uh, as starters for the first time. It would turn out to be the worst season in the history of the University of Michigan football. Uh, they would win only one game. That game would be the third of the season and it would be against a Southern team, Georgia Tech. Leaning on their segregation tradition, they would insist that Willis Ward not take the field. They wouldn't play against an African American. This incensed Ford, who threatened to quit the team but was encouraged by Willis Ward and others to play. They did so, they won that game, but it took so much of the fun out of the season um, that the team was never able to regroup itself and they would go on to lose the remainder of their games. That didn't mean that Ford didn't have a good year though. In this gallery, you'll find one of the awards that Ford was most proud of throughout his life. He was voted by his teammates his senior year as the most valuable player of the team. And he would go on to play in two All-Star games. He would earn from those uh, offers from uh, professional teams by the Green Bay Packers, the Detroit Lions, and the Chicago Bears. He would turn each of them down because he wanted to go into law school. He wanted to go into law school at the University of Michigan, but there was no job for him on campus and he couldn't afford the tuition. His College football coach, however, secured for him a position at Yale, and he became an assistant coach at Yale University, and in time would persuade the law school at Yale to accept him as a student. And he would spend six years at Yale, making many trips to New York City, broadening his horizons, learning many of the things, many of the skills that he would carry with him throughout life. It was also there at Yale where he experienced his first presidential campaign. He worked on the Wendell Wilkie campaign in 1940. And through these experiences, he would begin leaving behind his sense of isolationism and begin to look at things through a more international lens. In 1941, Gerald Ford graduated from Yale Law School and brought his degree back with him to Grand Rapids. And he and a friend of his, Phil Buchan, 
from the University of Michigan open up a law firm. But then events that had been circulating the globe since 1939 finally catch up with the United States and catch up with Gerald Ford here in Grand Rapids. When Japan attacks Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, Gerald Ford's life changes. He left his law firm behind, uh, entered the United States Navy as an athletic officer and was sent to North Carolina where he put um, pilots through pre-flight training. Uh, in, in essence, he was teaching them the spirit of competition. It was a busy time for him, but also a boring time for him. It wasn't where he felt he needed to be. He was 29 years old, he was single, and he wanted to be in the middle of things. He began almost immediately writing letters to those who would listen, those he thought could help find him a job aboard a naval ship. In 1943, his wishes finally were granted when he was assigned to an aircraft carrier that was under construction in Philadelphia. In November of 1943, they found themselves in the middle of the Pacific and Gerald Ford was indeed in the middle of things. He would spin from November of 1943 through December of 1944 in the Pacific as part of a great fleet that began the island hopping campaigns that would roll the Japanese Navy up and push them back to the homelands. He would earn eight battle stars aboard the ship and see battles off the coast of Australia through the uh, island chains um, in Formosa, in the Philippines, off Iwo Jima, until December of 1944, when he received orders to leave the ship. And as he was preparing to do that, the ship and the fleet were struck by a typhoon, Typhoon Cobra, which claimed three other ships that were part of the fleet and almost claimed the Monterey. Gerald Ford almost loses his life when he is almost swept from the decks into the ocean. But he pulls himself together and works with the captain and with the other officers and the sailors aboard the ship to save the ship. Then a week after the typhoon, he leaves the ship, reports to California, eventually ends up north of Chicago at a naval training center. And there in 1946 is mustered out of the Navy, returns to Grand Rapids, picks up his law practice again and begins looking at other things. Again, I'm Elaine Didier, director of the Gerald Ford Presidential Library and Museum. I hope you've enjoyed your virtual experience today and will continue to explore the many virtual and in-person experiences we offer at both the library and the museum. Our exhibits and programming are made possible through the support of the National Archives and Records Administration and the generous contributions of donors to the Gerald Ford Presidential Foundation. If you enjoyed your tour today, please consider joining the Foundation's Friends of Ford, which supports many of our activities. Now, we invite you to continue your virtual experience on our website, fordlibrarymuseum.gov. That's all one word, fordlibrarymuseum.gov, and explore more than 600,000 pages of documents and photos from our archival collections, images of museum artifacts, as well as video recordings of numerous outstanding speakers we have hosted at both the library and museum. Thank you for spending your time with us today, and we look forward to seeing you in person very soon.